Hello and welcome to the next episode of The Podcast, a cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. You're joined by your host, Heavy Days, and this episode, as always, was brought to you by our incredible sponsors. Seeds here now, number one seed bank in the industry, guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. Go check them out, all the hottest drops, all the best breeders. They've just put up some new stock. Go see if it's what you need to make your next run fire as hell. Likewise, in order to get the best run out of your genetics, you need to keep your garden happy and healthy. And for that, we'd like to give a shout out to our friends at Coppet Biological Systems. These guys have all the best predators in the game to keep bug infestations away and to fight off any unwanted issues you may be experiencing. Check out their Spidex Vital or their Afipar M, both fantastic products for fighting off spider mites or aphids respectively, two pests a lot of growers struggle with, but they're here to help you get on top of it. Furthermore, huge shout out to ProMix. These guys have been in the industry for years. You know them, they make great media-based products using peat and mycorrhiza, but guess what? Now you can get their fantastic mycorrhizal product on its own. ProMix Connect, the number one mycorrhizal product in the game, helping you to achieve greater yields, better resin, enhanced flavor and terpenes, helping you to make your next harvest the best to date. Check out ProMix Connect for all your mycorrhizal needs. We'd like to welcome our newest sponsor onto the show, Charlie's Cannabis. These guys are family-owned, small-batch craft cannabis out of Oklahoma City, providing you with fantastic flavors and incredibly high-quality flour for anyone who's in need of some high-quality medicine. Growing strains like Star Pebbles, Chemical Sunset, and so many more, go check out Charlie's Cannabis for all the best craft small batch Oklahoma grown cannabis. They've got all the flavors and terps you need to make sure that you're puffing good. Last but not least, huge shout out to the Patreon gang. You guys know you're the lifeblood of the show, helping to ensure episodes happen. If you would like to help support the show and ensure future content is continued to be created, please go to patreon.com forward slash the podcast and sign up. You'll get access to unheard content, additional interviews, giveaways, and so much more. Patreon gang, love you guys so much. Appreciate you. Welcome back, my friends, for part three of our epic chat with JJ NYC of Top Dog Genetics. If you haven't checked out the prior two installments of this episode, please go do so. It'll get you up to date and ready to get right into this final one where we're chatting genetics, history, all things related to Top Dog, and so, so, so much more. So, without further ado, let's get into it. I guess it sort of just speaks to that idea of like how sort of the hazy, longer flowering sativa stuff. It seems like it's really got a home in New York. Yeah, well, you know, in New York, you know, people have always, you know, wanted the best weed. So, um, and they want stuff that's different that not everyone else has. So, you know, look at yourself with a product that's unique uh, you, you're able to do that and almost build your own customer base off of that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, I was talking to Bob Hemphill recently, yet again, and he mentioned how grateful he was that you had gifted him an old Sensi star cutting that you had, and he was saying how much he loved it. And um, it made me think, you know, will we see any more Sensi star crosses from you? And is it one you like to smoke and breed with? Uh, well, I had, I was given a cut from a friend of mine, uh, from Washington. And I think, you know, he told me it was one of the old time Sensi store cuts and it was the more, uh, stretchy one, I guess. I guess there was a couple different ones that were around. So, um, yeah, so he gifted me that. And I did a little bit of work with it, and then I lost it, unfortunately. Yeah, I gave it to Bob, and um, my friend, I think he brought it back to an F3 or something, or F4, F3. I'm not sure. I, he, I, I have some of, the, some of his um, 
seed stock that he made with that original. So I think that he had gotten that cutting and then got some original Sensi store seeds and then uh, started to um, F1 and F2, you know, went, went back with it for a couple generations. So that's what he based it off of that cutting. And so, yeah, I just got the cutting and, you know, I crossed it out to uh, the star dog and I think a chem cross, another chem cross. I, I can't quite remember, but yeah, I did a couple of breedings with it and then I lost it and it was nice. It, it's kind of, I mean, an old school Amsterdam um, kind of uh, peppery. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it was, you know, it's all, it kind of reminded me of the star dog a little bit, but without the chem, you know, but it was kind of peppery. And, you know, back in the day, it definitely was uh, a special cut. Um, but, you know, if you put it up to today's standards, I don't think it would really uh, make the cut in most people's book. But, you know, um, if you're more of a nostalgia type of a guy and breeder like Bob is, then, you know, uh, then, yeah, that's something that that's going to interest you. And, you know, I think, you know, a lot of the stuff, you know, um, you know, our, our past is our future, you know, referencing some of these older cuts and older strains and, you know, trying to bring them back. Uh, revitalizing them and outcrossing them and you know uh, yeah so I think you know you know that's what I always say is our past is our future so um, I'm one of those guys that kind of like the, the that looks back on, on on some of these older strains as they not m might not be significant to most of the people you know on in today's world uh it it, it did mean something at, at some point for a reason so i still think that there's still you know a lot of uh things that could could come out good out of those genetics and especially something that's different compared to today's designer genetics yeah Great rundown. Thanks for giving us your answer to that one. One of our listeners asked a really interesting question and they were wondering when you're in the process of creating Stardog, for example, and you maybe grew out the seeds or they were tested via whatever means, did you find like the quality and the potency to like surprise you at all? Because I think a lot of people would probably agree, you know, they've got to be up there with some of the best and greatest seeds ever commercially produced. Did you have any idea like how big it was going to take off or was it all a bit of a surprise? No, I was a little bit of a surprise. I mean, I, I mean, I knew like the genetics that I was using were, you know, were special. And so, uh, but really they kind of took a life of, of their own. Like, you know, I, like I said, you know, I, when I first popped those seeds, you know, I don't know how many, man, maybe four or six seeds I might have popped because, you know, I, you know, back then, you know, I, I was growing 99 plants for, you know, uh, production, you know, and so 50 would be vegging and 49 would be flowering. So, like, so if, so if I take, you know, if I was going to pop, you know, four or six seeds, that means like four or six production plants weren't going to be able to be grown. So I wasn't able to, you know, do huge, you know, seed pops for selection. So when I first did that first, you know, uh, seed pop and found the, the, the Corey star dog, I was, you know, pretty impressed on, you know, what it was, you know? And so, uh, once I started to, uh, you know, get that out there, uh, I think one of the first few people I gave it to was, uh, was Joe B. Uh, cause he had given me the chem four. So I wanted to give him, you know, give him, you know, something for giving it back. So I was like, here's the quarry. So once the quarry got out there in Humboldt, 
it kind of took a life of its own, you know, and really started to become really popular out there. And um, yeah, I mean, that's really the only way I could explain it is it kind of took a life of its own, you know, and, uh, and a lot of these things happen that way where I might make something and, you know, it takes, you know, and I can test it. Like I just explained and I knew I had something really good and started getting, you know, passing that clone around and, st and, and, and until people, you know, got the clone and, and was able to grow it and finish it and the people that bought the seeds and bought the seeds and were able to grow them and finish them by the time they get to them. And by the time you get a final product, you're talking like a year later, you know, by the time I first made it a year or two later, by the time, you know, it starts getting into people's hands, starts getting passed around, starts making, taking a life of its own, then, I mean, that's, you know, so, you know, and that's basically like all my work has always been like that. Like, it's not like me telling you how great it is and you going and buying it it's people buying it and telling everyone else how great it is so a lot of the times that takes it takes time for that to, to happen and so um you know it's happened numerous times and so uh yeah it's the only way that i can really explain it to where you know you make something you know you can test it you know your friends and all but it's really the general public's perception of of what it is yeah i i guess it you know must have to have been a little bit surprising but yeah i guess great to get that feedback even if it does have a bit of a lag time before it gets to you something i was hoping you could answer for me was that i think it's undeniable you know trez dog as a male has made a number of killer strains out there but interestingly enough we really don't see a lot of Trez Dog females out there, clone only. There is one which I believe Stray Fox has a cut of one which he really likes and um, maybe another one or two floating around there. But do you have any thoughts on why maybe we don't see Trez Dog as much and how did you find the females? Well, the, the reason why that is because we never, I never real, there was never really commercially like released. There were, there were some small releases, but generally like that was really made for to be a, a breeding male so uh, a lot of the times you know i just made it was just one breeding so like i did the initial afghan chem d as per se um i think most of those seeds were sold on uh seed bay and not a lot of them you know uh, I still have some of those original uh, Afghan Kemdi uh, seeds. So out of that seed stock, I would, you know, pop and find another male. And then I did the back cross into the, into the Kemdi again. It made the double dog. Now the double dog became a little more um, accessible. And um, I, uh, you know, I got, I let some of those seeds, some of those seeds did get out and, and I think on seed bay also. And I think those, those ones were, I remember taking a picture of one of my original packs and it was just in a small little plastic Ziploc baggie with a, a hand printed uh, pen on, on, on the, um, on the plastic itself there. So there was no label or anything. It was just uh, a pen printed on the, on the plastic itself. And, it, you know, I said double dog and those were my original, that's how those original packs were sold. They were just unsealed in a little Ziploc baggie with 10 C 10 or 12 seeds in it. And it might've said, you know, uh, double dog, 12 seeds on it or something like that. So, you know, then, you know, obviously I took a male out of that and made the Trez dog. So when I made the Trez dog, um, that was just one breeding. I took a double dog male and I made like a certain amount of those seeds, which I still 
have some of those original stock of. So really at that point, I decided that I was going to, uh, that, w- that was going to be it. That was going to be, this was going to be my, my male strain, the trade dog. And uh, so there was very few seeds that, that, that we released that I, that I let go. And cause I want, you know, cause that was going to be, you know, I wanted to get a little bit of feedback from it, I think. And then, you know, I wanted to be that, ex- I wanted that to be exclusive from, that was my exclusive strain, you know? So really that's like one of the reasons why like no one else really has it because we, n- I never really worked it really pat- past that, you know, uh, I had given, you know, we've, um, you know, I, I have passed some seeds off to money. He has made some uh, chem D back cross threes and I think some fours, uh, but we've never released them or we've never worked any of those seeds. He, he, you know, we have them for future, for future use, but um, yeah, it was never, the trade dog was never intended to be a production uh, seed strain. It was really supposed to be my exclusive uh, mail that, you know, no one else was going to be able to have. Yeah. Interesting. Like, that's a brilliant answer as to why we don't see much trade dog females out there. And, and really, you know, and really, if you look at it, like, you know, the people now that are copying me and ripping me off, you know, uh, you know, they could only use st- the seeds made from that where they can't get that original seed stock. Yeah, sure. You kind of segued into the next question we had, which was from one of our listeners, but I'll admit I too was interested in this one. Uh, sort of along the lines of what you just mentioned. What's the story behind Goo from Greenpoint Seeds using Stardog? It seems like I've heard rumors that it was like your cut exactly, or is it just from your seed stock? What's the backstory there? Well, you know, I'm just going back a little bit when I had my, my legal troubles and my absence of the internet. During, during that, and that was right in the inception of um, Instagram, I would say. So I think that was, we're talking like 2014, maybe, I think 2014. So, you know, I had, you know, I had, like I mentioned, I had gotten to a jammed up a little bit there and I had to close down. So I was absent from the internet for for a little bit a while but during that time like unknown to me during that time my stuff was blowing up like i had gotten in trouble and i had kind of dropped out of the scene a little bit and so uh during that time i was just blowing up you know my seeds were blowing up like we were getting really popular but we were nowhere to be found so uh and that's when uh green point uh they had gotten some of my original uh, star dog stock. And so they decided, you know, since I wasn't around that, you know, they made some kind of a statement saying that I was retired and that they were, you know, going to further on the genetics and so on and so forth. And just kind of took advantage of the situation that I was kind of down and out at the time and you know i you know at the time i kind of you know i think you know i i rebelled with some posts and stuff like that there wasn't really much i could do because i wasn't growing at the time and so really just really um you know uh gave me more incentive to get my shit together and to and to really you know and 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 really uh widen my perspective of the possibility of this really being uh something uh, uh something because you know back back then you know uh the, the only really big breeders back then were kind of from amsterdam you know and so those were th- those guys were only the real those guys were really legitimate and you know they, they were you know obviously working under you know uh easier conditions that we were but you know the thing about you know the difference between uh dutch breeders and american breeders is we have so much more passion 
uh, you know, you go over to Amsterdam and, you know, these guys are smoking spliffs with fucking tobacco in it because the weed is too strong and fucking whatever. And, you know, we show up over there and we're smoking bombs of fucking straight fucking diesel. And they're looking like that. I was like, we're fucking crazy, you know? So, you know, uh, the Americans have always had much more passion for uh for stronger the strongest weed you know and so uh and and basically the dutch is a, the dutch have everything they got over there they've got from us originally you know it's just that they were you know working you know not under prohibition like we were so that's really why the reason why a lot of those genetics wound up in in amsterdam because they were able to work there so, I mean, you know, so the, the Americans always had a strong passion for the, the best of the best, you know. So, you know, you know, when, when we, you know, when I first was coming up and doing, doing what we were doing, you know, doing what I was doing, you know, I never, you know, you know, would, you know, uh, try to compare myself to a Neville or a, a Sensi Seeds or a Shanti Bob or, 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 or any of these guys, you know, because, you know, they were just that, you know, such a high level. And, you know, and we were just, you know, a bunch of people on the Internet just trying to, you know, figure things out and, you know, make our own way, so to speak. Not knowing that, you know, the, the, geneti the genetics that we were working with were, you know, you know, some of the best in, in, in the whole wide world, you know, and. You know, uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's just really kind of hard to explain, you know, the reason why that is, you know, and, and, and some of it's just kind of pure luck because, you know, we were only given the stuff that we had access to, you know, so if we didn't have access to any of that stuff. We never would have been able to have it, obviously, you know, so, you know, a lot of places are kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, everyone, every place in the world kind of has their own uh, kind of like home strains that were popular at the time, you know, and, and, that, and that's and that's all that they know, because that's what they grew up around, you know, so, you know, like, you know, fortunately for us, you know, uh, you know, the chems were around and. And, you know, not knowing that they would be, you know, the strains that they are today, you know, you know, and going back to, you know, some of the, uh, you know, the older stuff that I had seen, the hash plants, the ties and stuff like that, you know, back then, you know, I didn't really have a really full, a full grasp of the whole genetic uh, pool, you know, like I do today. You know, the, you know, the knowledge and the experience just wasn't there, you know, so, you know, you see all of these different strains, you know, that, you know, come out of Amsterdam and, you know, uh, you know, in, in, you know, and looking back, like, you know, how, how many of them are still relevant today? Uh, in, in today's world, you know, when, when back then they were super popular, you know, so, you know, it, you know, it, you know, it was never, you know, it, you know it, it's, it's hard to believe that, you know, we've built up, you know, a, a genetic diversity in the States here that just kind of just lead the world, you know, it's, you know, and it's just from people's passion for the flower itself and for taking risks and just traveling and just you know um you know we we you know stand on the shoulders of giants you know of people that you know initial initially you know went out and took those risks hugely hugely agree so when you were developing the trez dog line i'm wondering what how were you making your selection? Were you just selecting a male that you felt best looked like the chem D sort of each time? And what would be your general tips for listeners who are hoping to get better at selecting males? Yeah. I mean, that's really, you know, pretty much, you know, um, yeah, I mean, early on, you know, it, it was, you know, and that was really, I guess the, the concept of back crossing, you know, uh, was just really trying to like tighten up 
the gene pool, you know, around, uh, you know, around the Chem D, you know, I, you know, I had, I've had, you know, a little bit of breeding knowledge just from, uh, from dogs, uh, from pit bulls and stuff. And I used to study the, 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 the breeding lines and how they would, you know, do things and how a certain dog would, would become uh, a, a line in itself and how that was done meaning like a one male, almost, almost kind of like, you know, a strain, uh, you know, like it's, it's the same thing with cannabis, a strain within a strain. So, um, yeah, so I had a little bit of knowledge of that and a lot of it had to do with, you know, um, this going back to the original um, genetics is, so uh, you know, and it's really a, just a theory of back crossing and stuff. And, and also I had read a little bit, you know, on the Mel Frank stuff and uh, the concept of cubing and, and back crossing in Cuban and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I thought that would, you know, be the best way to really just, you know, try to tighten up the, the, the gene pool of, of the, of the chem D so, um, you know, in, so, you know, initially, you know, I, I would probably say there was no real selection when I first took my first, you know, um, initial male. And I just really, you know, just, there was just really a, a donor male and, you know, and just really, just really, really, that's really the only thing it was really donating was the male part of it because my, my vision was to just to keep bringing it back you know until you know a certain point and then testing you know not really testing as i went along you know in in the very beginning and um yeah so i mean once you know you know once i got to uh you know to 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 the trade dog and then that's when uh, i um uh, you know, because I've used a lot of different males of that. And, and initially, like, I would just, you know, I had, uh, I would do a breeding and then kill the male, you know. And so, you know, so really, you know, and, and at that point, it really wasn't really like my vision to continuously breed. It was just because I had a certain, um, clone at the time that i wanted to preserve so i would just you know i would just pop a new mail and 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 do it bam you know what i mean then i'd go back to production you know and then i'd get another new clone sometime and be like well i don't have to keep a mail i mean i'll just start new a new seeds and find a new mail and you know so that was really you know uh the way I did it in the very beginning, you know, cause I, you know, I, you know, I didn't really have a lot of, you know, breeding experience and I was just kind of learning as I go along, you know, whereas now, you know, I do a lot more, um, uh, more selections on the male and um, looking for certain characteristics and kind of like one good example would have been like the tray dog times a sour diesel, which made the sour dog. So when, so when I did those, when I did that initial cross, you know, um, you know, my thing was, all right, you know, I want to produce a sour diesel, you know, uh, sour diesel line. So um, it was quite easy to pick, the mail for the next batch because the um the tray dog you know it it grew short you know so any of those short phenos obviously would have been more tray dog leaning so if i wanted a more sour leaning one i was looking for a more stretchier uh sour leaning type of structure you know so you know that's one way of doing it is like you get two different opposite of, of the spectrum you got a tall plant and a short plant well you want to you want to breed for the tall plant but you use a short plant for the male donor and then so you do that initial cross and then just select for the tall plants going there there onward af after so you know um and then you know uh you know and then there's another way of doing it where you 
actually grow out your males and females. And then, you know, you see the, the male or the female that you like, and then you try to pick a male that's, that grows similar to that. So, you know, so you would be like, all right, you know, these things both look sim one's a male, one's a female. So, you know, you would know that that male would kind of show the same characteristics as that female, but that's doing a little bit more work, you know, and that's really something that people don't want to do nowadays, you know, and this is one of the things that kind of makes me mad. And it's not that, you know, I don't get mad that people use my genetics and, and, and outcross them to other things, you know, which I don't have no problem with, you know, and I don't get mad that people are, you know, they cross, you know, they are going to, they want to work with the chem dog or whatever, but if they're going to work with the chem dog, or whatever, well, why don't you use, make your own male use your own genetics your own outcross what they want to do is they, they just want to take my stuff that i work and cross it into a chem and make it their chem instead of going and getting their own afghan their own hindu kush or whatever the outcross that they want to do make their own male do all that work and you know and, and a lot of that takes a lot of time you know, and, and that's what people do not want to do nowadays. They just want to steal people's work, make a quick cross, put it on Instagram and try to make a quick buck. And, you know, and so a lot of people will sell their stuff for half your price or what, whatever, $50 a pack. And, you know, I'm selling my stuff for double or triple that price because I put that amount of work in. I have years of work in that cross and someone just takes that now and F2s it. And, you know, so that, that's, that, that's the stuff that I don't like. If, if people want to take my stuff and out cross it and use it for something different, I mean, I'm happy that, that, that they do it, but you know, the people that just want to, you know, kind of pray off for your work you know, and then there's always the argument, well, if you don't like it, don't sell regular seeds or once you sell them, then, you know, so there's all these different arguments and, you know, it's just really um, on how you want to, you know, conduct yourself and be known as, you know, if you want to be one of those people and, you know, and there's always going to be people that are going to support them because, you know, some people, you know, they just want to buy cheap seeds or, you know, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, just like, you know, going back to, you know, the res dog thing, you know, there's always going to be someone out there that's going to, you know, uh, that's going to support, support them. And it's the same thing with me. You know, there's, there's people that are always going to support you and there's always going to people that are going to hate you. And those, that's one thing that you got to you know, come to grips with no matter who you are, you can think of anything in the world, the best singer, the best soccer star, whatever. There's always going to be someone that's going to be like, you know, I don't like that person because of this or that or whatever. So that's fine. I could live with that. Just as long as you have more people that support you than that don't, than that don't like you. Yeah, some wise words right there. What was interesting about that answer was how you were mentioning that, like, you know, each sort of breeding is like its own unique offering because it's you're using the male like one time only. Is that still the case or have you been keeping males more lately? No, I keep males now. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. You know, uh, one of our last, you know, I kind of learned because one of the, the, the trade dog, one of the last ones I used was, was one of the purple we called the purple pheno and that one you know everything that that was that male was bred to came out kind of purplish we had the sour dog the uh, original new york city diesel um there was a, a a few other strains too uh that, that 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 came out like that and um so after that yeah you know after that you know i decided that you know it, it's 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 better for me to try to keep one male and to, to, to keep reusing that. And, you know, since I'm not, you know, I'm growing for production anymore. Um, so that, you know, that whole formula now is, you know, is, is different. So um, really it, it's more about uh, the amount of uh, different strains that I have 
and uh, yeah, just the just the overall plant count overall. So you know, I'm able to keep a lot more different type of females. I think right now I have I don't know maybe like four or five different males that I'm sitting on. Nice, nice. It must be, you know, sort of relaxing nowadays that you're able to do that as opposed to in the past where it was maybe a bit more harder to do that. But uh, another question we got from one of our listeners was, how would you describe Stardog for someone who's never been able to try it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's got like, it's kind of a, it's kind of piney, you know, uh, chemi, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's very unique, you know, and, um, yeah, it, I mean, it's kind of, it's really a good blend between the chem four and the chem D, you know, so, you know, there's a little bit of like piney dirtiness in there. I guess that's really what I'm looking to looking to looking for, a piney dirtiness and a chemi, you know, and, and, and so it's kind of almost a layered, a little bit of a layered palette, and that's really uh, one of the things about the chems because um, you know you can cross a chem into something that's terpy and still retain those terps and get like a a chem. Uh, a layered chem fla- flavor and so i think that's really you know what a lot of people uh, that are really into terps are looking for is like you know uh, you get that layered flavor flavor where you're getting multiple different uh different flavors in one hit where you could taste chem you could taste pine you could you could taste fruit or whatever it is and so that's what makes uh, a lot of these uh strains really unique yeah it sounds delicious doesn't it well that was a bit of a cheeky segue question because as i'm sure you're pretty well aware Stardog has really become a major player in the uk scene you know it's almost like it's the new cheese in a sense I guess I'm just sort of wondering, like, how does it feel to have a strain that's become that critically acclaimed? Like, there are people who have had popular strains, but, you know, when you're at that point, it's really to a different magnitude, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of funny because, like, uh, you know, I don't really, you know, I've been to the UK once, you know, for a brief time, so I haven't really spent a lot of time there. And so, you know, it's really uh the, the the people of the uk that's kind of blown that up you know uh some you know someone you know wound up getting some seeds and some um uh the cutting um i forget what what is the um the cutting the, the popular cutting that was over there it's someone's name i'm trying to it's it, it's a particular type of uh cutting so yeah so you know um yeah, I mean, I, I, I just finding them, it's its amazing, you know, what I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable, you know, because, you know, it's just something that just, you know, took a life of its own, you know, like it's, it, it you know, who, you know, uh, it's just really hard to explain because, you know, I, I didn't really have anything personally to do with that you know like you know i sold the seeds and somehow they got into the hands of someone over there and it just took a life of its own it just you know and i know this has been going on for quite some time so at least five or six years now you know i've I've been hearing this and uh that you know the, the the star dog has just you know, taking over has taking over the cheese as as the most you know popular commercial strain. Um, I get a lot of people you know telling me how good it is, and I have a lot of people telling me how bad it is because it's being so commercially grown. So, um, and and some of it they don't even know if it's really the Star Dog or someone just putting the name Star Dog on it. So. Um, yeah yeah like i said it's just it's just amazing because it, it's nothing that i that i can i can't take claim to that because so, someone someone else did that and you know just going back to 
when something's that good that it just takes its life of its own, I can't really say anything else other than that. So you get some kudos, I think. But I quickly Googled the, the name of it, and uh, I think it's called Manny's Cut. Man, Yeah, the Manny's Cut, correct. Yeah, the Manny's Cut, right. So that's one of the more popular. Uh, I think that's the most popular one I've heard is the Manny's Cut. So I'm not familiar with the Manny's Cut, or I don't know anything about it. But, um, yeah, it's made a name for itself, Man, whoever Manny is. Yeah, I mean, hopefully if you ever head back, someone will have a bag waiting for you. But um, on to another sort of international-based question. A few different fans actually asked me to try to find out from you, what's uh, the? can you give us the lowdown on the Top Dog Thailand endeavor? You know, I think people have been following it and are like, oh, this seems very interesting. Like, what's the backstory behind all of that? Yeah, well, you know, um, yeah. I mean, we're really interested. I've always been really interested in, in, in Thai weed. You know, I had, and I told you the story of my experience with, you know, earlier. And so, I mean, that's always kind of stuck with me, you know? So, um, you know, once we, you know, I started seeing that, you know, they were, you know, starting a, a, a medical thing and, um, uh, you know, they were, you know, so we, you know, we, we decided, you know, that we were, you know, wanted to, you know, to try to uh, get more information. And they actually had a, um, uh, I'm trying to think the name of it now, but they had a, 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 a CBD uh, show in, in Bangkok. And so, you know, we decided to, to go there and, and, and check it out, you know, and, and, you know, make new contacts. And, and, and so, um, uh, a friend of mine, me and a friend of mine, um, he's a Pantagru lion and he was the one that actually, uh, gave me the, uh, that Sensi star cut. So, um, you know, we decided to, uh, you know, take a trip over there and, you know, get our feet wet to see what, you know, see if we could get into the market somehow. And so we went over there and we were able to, you know, uh, establish some contacts, you know, start getting some information and everything. And then my friend stayed over there for, he stayed over there for a few months, actually. And so um, he wound up going up uh, into Chiang Mai and visited a few farms and grows and stuff and started collecting seed. And so really, uh, you know, we you know, decided that, you know, we wanted to, you know, try to, um, on one end, try to start collecting land race seed and try to start exploring some of the mythical uh, Thai stick strains that have been, you know, uh, talked about and, you know, the ones that I have experienced from personal, uh, you know, uh, f from, from myself um, experience, personal experience. So, you know, we want to uh, try to find some of these strains and, you know, bring them, you know, back to uh, you know, the forefront and because these things were, you know, very, uh, they have a place in history and, and for a reason. And uh, so, you know, a lot of that, you know, we're finding out a lot of different things about, you know, the, the tie stick, a lot of it had to do with the curing process and, and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, and as well as long with the strain. So, yeah, we want to, um, yeah, so that was one end of it is we wanted to, you know, bring back the lore of the ind indigenous, you know, land race strains. And then on the other hand, we wanted to bring them up to speed with modern technology. And, uh, you know, from what, you know, we uh, experienced, uh, there seems to be a lot of the Dutch um, seed companies are trying to make influence over there and um, we think that we're better we know that we're better than the Dutch and so we want to make sure that uh, Thailand is going to be having 
you know, the best strains available from America and, um, and not get bamboozled by the Dutch because they're being targeted because they're an upstart, an up, upstart country. They don't know the difference between uh, a, a lot of this stuff. So we want to educate them. And we, and we also, you know, uh, we want to bring, you know, um, you know, uh, modern medical um, standards there and as in testing and, um, and, 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 and all of that, you know, cause um, you know, they, they, they want to, um, you know, have a, a medical CBD program over there. Um, they're, they're having problems with, um, with strains over there. You know, a lot of them, uh, a lot of the strains uh, can't grow well over there. Uh, they're not testing for CBD. Uh, high you know a lot of them are um got uh thc in them so you know there's there you know there's a, a, a lot of stuff that you know um they're really on the ground level of and so um you know they they need uh to be shown you know the right way and, and hopefully you know we can um help influence them to uh you know, you know, to do things uh, the, in the correct way, because I think, uh, you know, there's, you know, um, uh, a, hu a huge, a um, huge possible, you know, they, you know, uh, of Asia, you know, because no one, no one in Asia is really, you know, taking the forefront for medical over there. I know that China has some type of thing going on, but, um, you know, in Asia itself, I mean, uh, Korea, South Korea, uh, Japan, uh, you know, that there's, uh, you know, a lot of neighboring countries. And so I, you know, I see, you know, uh, the prospect of, uh, you know, uh, of a lot of, of a good, you know, uh, economy. They have um, a, a, a lot of tourists over there. Uh, that you know, so you know, they're, they're talking about a future uh, letting tourists buy you know cannabis or you know, so uh, you know, I see uh, you know a lot of uh, future prospects there possibly. So we we want to we want to get in on on the ground floor on some of that stuff, hopefully, and, and have some influence uh, around the world. Yeah, nice, nice. That's a good idea. I, I guess I never really thought about the Dutch getting into those markets, but it makes sense that they would be in there nice and early trying to get the jump the gun on people. Well, you know, the funny thing was I sat, we sat in on a, um, you know, they did a discussion and stuff, a uh, pr presentation, and they showed like all their target markets around the world. And the funny thing was, the number one target market was excluded, which is America. Why, why wouldn't you want to target America? Because you're irrelevant in, in the market as it is now, as most, you know, Dutch companies are. So now, I mean, so now they have to go into all these upstart countries to where they don't know any better. Yeah, it's interesting. Do you think that it was purely just the change in laws which led to sort of the decline of Amsterdam? Or do you think that it's maybe just, you know, more factors than just that? Uh, that's part of it. But I don't think, I mean, their, their, their breeding techniques and, and knowledge were, you know, uh, very bad. I mean, they were breeding for all the wrong things early finishers, heavy yielders, orange hairs. You know, so after years and years of bottlenecking and crossing the same things into the same things into the same things, you, you get what you got today. Yeah, certainly. I think it's um, it's a tough situation if you're growing with Amsterdam genetics and hoping to get a good outcome <laughs> well at one time they were the best in the world you know I mean if you go back to you know the 
the the the the late Neville days, you know, and uh, and and I say, you know, uh, the late '80s, '88, '89, '90, uh, and then going into the Sensi Seed, and they were probably good up until about '95. Uh, anything uh, from Sensi Seeds that had the original cellophane card pack it was a cell it was the see-through cellophane with just a card in it and then you had your your you used to be able to get i think it was 15 or 16 seeds that they gave you originally in that cellophane pack and it just had the card in it with the northern lights on it and then you would flip it around and and so uh and then uh probably the last the, the last best thing that they did was the jack career the original jack career and uh i think that was what in like 94 95 somewhere in the mid 90s and that was kind of after that that was it uh they had cha they changed their packaging shortly after that and it was uh, the, the the product was never the same i had a friend that went out and got some of the original jack herrera in the cellophane pack and he brought it back and he he grew it out and i remember it was, it was like a 77 day plant but it used to i mean the the top buds were your forearms. It, it, it was just a heavy yielder. It, it went a little bit longer. It had a really nice um, hazy tip to it, you know, but it was kind of, it wasn't super strong or nothing, but it was really nice, like the original Jack Herrera cut. And um, so, I mean, these guys, uh, once they found out, it started to produce and they just started pumping it out. And then, I mean, they just started overproducing it. And I was like, whoa, whoa, hold on now. I'm, I'm getting overburdened with this stuff. It's not moving anymore. I was like, we got to cut it out. Eventually, you know, I told them we can't do this anymore. It's just not selling. So they're like, all right, no problem. We have we have the rest of the pack of seeds that we have. I was like, all right, kill it. All right. So a few days, a few years down the road, I'm like, Hey, why don't you, you know, find that pack of Jack career and get that going again. Oh, I can't find it. I lost it. All right. So at that time I was doing the seed bay thing and getting, getting the seed credit. So I was like, I'll get you another pack of the Jack career. So I got him a, the new i got them in the new packaging i think it was in uh it was in the bubble and the box and all of that and so i give them a you know a pack of the jack career and you know i'm um, looking forward to him finishing it out you know he finishes it out shows me the final product and it was just shit it was just so disappointing it just was nothing like the original it was just this stringy fucking bullshit it was just so disappointing and just yeah i mean and really i mean to sum it up that's kind of you know how i feel about most dutch genetics you know there are a few exceptions karma and a few other guys that are that are out there doing the real thing. But, you know, any of the old original guys are just pretty much just, you know, going through the fucking, you know, emotions and just producing shit that, you know, for, for pretty much for souvenir purposes, because they're really not worth much more than you know the packaging itself you know so i wouldn't you know i mean what what see what 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 strains of greenhouse are relevant in today's uh, on, on instagram you know you can go down uh, the, the whole list of all of them and you know what's relevant today and, and really a lot of them are offering american genetics now and branding themselves such as yeah, yeah, I think Barney's Farm have just come out with a, like, gelato wedding cake. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 I saw that, yeah. Uh, well, interesting stuff. I mean, to bring the focus back to the U.S., um, you know, the cannabis climate around the, sorry, the legal climate around cannabis in the U.S. has been a sort of changing landscape. And there's a bit of a sentiment nowadays that uh, both legally and financially, California is just starting to push growers out of the market and even out of the state. 
What's your thoughts on the legal climate in the US and how do you feel about some of the newer places opening up and becoming the hotspot like, say, Oklahoma? Um, well, I got kind of mixed feelings on some of it because a lot of it is just geared towards money and corporate, like, like, like California. You know, um, if you were a small mom and pop operation, you know, uh, they just make it so difficult uh, for you to operate that it's just not feasible. You know, the licensing costs, the process of getting a license, uh, a lot of places you have to secure a, a location to get a license. So that means you're, you're, you're going to be renting out um, a warehouse possibly for a year or two, even before you could even start uh, working there. You know, so uh, the the, the 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 startup cost on 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 some of these is just it's just ridiculous, and they have it set up uh, so it favors uh, big money and corporations. Um, on the other hand, you know, you have states like um, Oklahoma and Oregon where anyone with three thousand dollars can go and set up shop. Unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of money in those states, you know, so um, what's going to happen in Oklahoma is, you know, is the same thing that happened in Oregon. You know, once they got up into full speed, full production and licensed, you're going to have 10,000 people that are producing and trying to sell weed all in the same spot. And um, how many, you know, as far as I know, Oregon and Oklahoma ain't any type of tourist attraction. Um, the the, the uh, household income is probably very low. So you're really stuck in a market where it's oversaturated. There's not a lot of money. And everyone's fighting over the same nickel, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of fucked up, you know, because they, you know, that, you know, uh, the same thing in, you know, is, is, is happening in, in New Jersey now and in New York. You know, they, they, you know, they say they want to open it up for, you know, um, people that you know has been affected by the drug war and and this and that you know and then they start making up all these rules you know you got to be a resident for three years all your money's got to be in the bank for three years uh you know uh, uh and then you got towns uh you know uh all right we got a town that uh we don't want we don't want a wreck in our town so we're not you know we're not going to allow it or we're going to allow four licenses and you know the people with political connections and money and who who or who knows how that licensing process is going to be how how that's going to go down and so um yeah, so a lot of a lot of people uh, get 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 shut out, and you know even you know someone like myself, and who some may say has got some type of reputation or or whatever you may think in the game, you know, it really doesn't mean shit to a lot of these people. You you know what I mean? Because uh, you know a lot of these people are only interested in in uh, these are corporate people, uh, you know, and they're only the only thing they know how to do is count money, and you know the the the, the corporate structure is hey if we made ten thousand uh, ten million this year and we only make eight million next year, well we lost two million in in their eyes. So, you know, uh, I see it as more of a commodity, you know, and so, um, yeah, it's really going to be interesting on how, you know, um, 
this all plays out because the way that I see it is if you can't get in now, you ain't going to get in later, you know, and that's kind of like what's happened here in Colorado because um, in the early days of medical, uh, just anyone could have just gotten set up anywhere, you know, and then, you know, they, they, uh, you know, they brought rec down and, you know, they, they, uh, they made a lot of rules and they forced a lot of people out for different reasons, you know, uh, and, and they can do it through zoning and through, you know, if you have a, a, a record and there's just a lot of these different things, you know, that, that, that they do to, uh, to, to make it make it you know virtually impossible for a small time operator to, to get into it you know so it's you know really uh, geared towards big money a lot of these states seem and, and and those are the states that that have the money you know that you will be able to make you know some type of a profit you know what I mean but you know the the, the startup costs, or in the millions, you know, and, you know, we, we are working class people, most of us. And, you know, if we had millions of dollars, quite frankly, we wouldn't be who we are now. You know what I mean? So, you know, there's a, you know, there's a big gap in between, between, you know, uh, reality and perception and, uh, you know, wh what people think the market is, is going to be. Yeah, hugely. So a sentiment I've heard expressed a little bit more recently is that there's a sort of growing suspicion that national legalization may not be too far off the future. Do you see that being a possibility? Well, you know, it's really politics and, you know, unfortunately politics in America is really fucked up right now. And, you know, it's really uh, kind of like two parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. And, you know, most of the Republicans don't favor cannabis legalization. Most of the states that aren't legal or run by Republicans. With that being said, our president is a Democrat. And at first it seemed like he was signaling towards legalization. And now it seems like he's signaling against federal legalization. And so, you know, it's kind of, caught in the middle because originally um, the drug war was started by executive order by Richard Nixon, the president. And it could be ended by executive order by the president Biden, if he wanted to. But no one seems, and it could have been done by every other president in between. And so uh you know, I don't see them doing it unless it's beneficial for them somehow. And uh, for them to just keep things at status quo kind of, you know, kind of protects them. And it's kind of like the same kind of issue of, of the immigration issue that we have here where they just, it's fucked up, but they don't want to, they don't want to fix it. They just want to keep it the way that it is. So, um, yeah. And then, you know, go, and then the only other way to change it is by an act of Congress. So if you want to do it by act of Congress, then you need Republicans to get on board. And, you know, the, the politics in this country are so po polarizing that it's just, you know, it's like living in two different worlds. Yeah, it feels very tense, very polarized at the moment, doesn't it? So, I just wanted to ask you a question I love to ask all guests, 
what would be some advice you would give to someone who's maybe hoping to start breeding maybe now maybe down the track what do you think some good advice you'd give to someone um is it is try to do something original you know um you know you can't really you got to make your own way and not really ride off the coattails of other people's success which you can in in a certain way you know if you do it the right way but you want to do it in a way of creating something new not copying what something old so you, know, you could take something that's popular and new and cross it into something that's totally different and possibly come up with something uh so uh yeah i mean that's really you know really the thing is just to try to be original you know and you know like i say your our past is our future and a lot of people only look at the status quo of what's popular today. You know, I'm the kind of guy that want to go back into land races, go back to the original start of things and start from there, you know, start over again, or use that into some of the stuff that, into some of the new modern stuff. You know, uh, the key is to create new and not really try to uh, replicate what is. Yeah, that's some great advice. And I mean, you just referenced wanting to dig into some land race stuff. I noticed on your Instagram, you'd post some Afghani seeds recently. And it made me wonder, are these some of the stocks you might be looking to work with? And what sort of land races in general would you want to work with? Yeah, well, right now there seems to be a big um, search for uh, roadkill skunk. You know, so, you know, in my opinion... You know, that's going to be found in some Afghan strains. Uh, so, you know, looking back on the history of it all, uh, yeah, that's where I think you really got to start. You know, so, you know, um, really, you know, just like, you know, like I was saying, you know, about the HP-13 and that land race strain, uh, yeah, you have to, you have to go out and you have to, uh search for stuff you have to try new stuff um you know you got to you know do stuff that people aren't doing and that's how you find stuff that's special and unique you know you 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 know you find something that's different and you know uh you just you know you you you, you start you start from there and start working off of that it, it, it's a step-by-step process and you know really um you know, with the amount of uh, land race stuff that's available today, uh, you know, the, there's Indian stuff, uh, Hindu Kush, uh, Afghan, you know, and that's really, you know, the base of, you know, all of the genetics that we have today. You know, is this that people, you know, they're, they're, they're too lazy, they don't want to put in the work, you know, a lot of it takes a lot of time. And a lot of effort, a lot of a lot of time. You're you 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 know you're you're wasting your time. A lot of wasted time, you know. So you know people don't want to do that. They just want to do what's easiest for them, and just it's easier to rip off someone else's stuff and do you know do some some kind of cross like that. And uh, so you know that's really kind of what separates you know people that lead you know, uh, compared to people that follow, you know, if you're a, if you're a leader, you're going to go out there and you're going to find your own stuff, you know, one way or the other, you know, there's so much stuff out there, you know, you just got to go out there and find it and, um, and yeah, and just grow it. You know, I tell people to pop seeds, you know what I mean? Pop, keep popping seeds, you know, cause that's where the next best clone is going to be found, obviously. You know, and where is that going to where is that seed going to come from? Well, that could be come from anywhere. So, you know, that's 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 the joy and the anticipation that you get when you pop something new because you want to see, you know, what, what it is, you know, and as in especially if you made it yourself, you know, then it's, you know, then, then you have that much more 
pride to put into it, you know, but if you're just really searching for something, you know, you just got to try to, you know, um, come up with a game plan and just, um, you know, have an idea on, you know, what you want to do. And kind of like what I'm saying about this roadkill skunk stuff, for me, you know, I'm searching for it and, you know, I'm just going to have to try popping different land race Afghanis, you know, until I can find something that's similar. You know, you may find the next chem, something fuely, or you don't know what could come out of some of this stuff because, that, you know, that's been the foundation for all of the stuff that we've 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 had for a long time now you know there's been a a, a lot of um uh um unstable situations over there so the um you know i don't know you know um you know how you know that's affected you know uh indigenous uh farmer generational farmers who who traditionally farm from seed crop to seed crop to seed crop to seed crop and produce hash from those seed, you know from that stuff and that hash actually is what uh provides for their family so uh, you know there was always great family pride in the pro in the product and production and the product that they would, would bring out because that's what kept their family alive so it, it, it was something that was always kept in the family generation after generation so after you break that cycle you know where, where are you then so you know after all the you know the fighting and and and, and all this stuff throughout the the years you know um you just got to think to yourself you know how much has that affected some of those indigenous strains and and then and 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 has some of them been lost forever and and a lot of that can just you know you can just look back at the seed i mean the hash production and how that is because that's how that i mean that's what all of that at the end you know produces the hash and afghanistan was always known as the one of the best hash producing countries in the world and you know it, it became that into be becoming just a commercial grade so, you know, there's a lot, you know, unless you're, you know, on on the ground and got intimate knowledge of the region and, you know, and stuff like that, you know, um, which people do. You know, there's a lot of English people that are able to, you know, that are Afghani and Muslim and are able to, you know, travel back and forth to the country, to the homeland. Where if you and I went there and they seen our white asses, they would behead us. So, uh, you know, uh, for us traveling into those regions would be, you know, uh, very dangerous and, you know, and something that I wouldn't wouldn't want to do, you know. But, you know, uh, I, I believe that, you know, those genetics are uh, possibly still out there, but you got to go out there and get them. Yeah, a comprehensive answer there. And while we're on the topic of, you know, advocating for popping seeds, which we always do, I'd like to know, how many seeds do you pop when you're looking to search through a line to try to figure out what's inside it? As many as possible. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it, it's kind of hard, you know, um, you know, when you're just working you know uh not in a uh, commercial fa facility so uh you know you got to pick and choose you know kind of um the direction on what projects you you want to do uh space is always a concern uh because i mean obviously uh you know, uh, you just can't, you know, there's just not a ro enough room for all plants. But um, like right now, um, I'm popping um, some Sour Diesel BX3 F2s. And I think I got about 20 of them going right now. And so, I mean, ideally, I would like to do a lot more than 20. But that's probably about the limit that I could do in uh, in in the confines of 
the space that I'm working working with now. Um, you know, when we um, are doing these big uh, pheno seed hunts in, in, in the warehouse, you know, we're popping 200, 100, you know, uh, we're doing uh, big, um, big seed pops and pheno hunts. And, you know, like I explained earlier, most of that is for, you know, uh, for hash and, and for flower production. So, you know, um, luckily, I'm able to um, um, work with some of those selections that, you know, that we're working uh, out of the um, warehouse with. But um, me personally, you know, uh, when I'm doing the seed thing, like I explained earlier, I'm doing about 20 of those. Uh, so what I'll probably wind up doing is running them, um, selecting, uh, uh, a male or two possibly and then um, breeding them I, I would cross them and then I would um, find the um, the the pheno that I thought best resembled the sour diesel and then those would be my next generation of seeds that I would work with yeah what a great answer you you filled in many of the blanks I had there a question we got from one of our listeners is, can you tell us a little bit about the bubblegum chem that you used to have and have used in the past? Yeah, uh, the, the, the bubblegum chem uh, originally was uh, Trey Dog bubblegum. So um, that was the original cross. Um, I had gotten the bubblegum cutting. I don't even remember where I originally got it from. But yeah, it was definitely the real deal bubble gum, uh, fruity, uh, re really a uh, crystally. Um, yeah, it, it, it was it was it was nice. I uh, I brought it out here. Um, a friend of mine, Motive. Um, I gave him some seeds, and he did some F two work with it. He gave me some of those seeds back. Which I uh, which I sold some of them, and yeah, um, I haven't really done much other than uh, other than that with the with the bubble gum cam. That makes sense because I do remember seeing some of those F twos on his page as well. Okay, so it all ties together. Yeah, and it wasn't really a strain that I really planned on working. You know, it was like one of the things where I'd explained earlier where I'd gotten the, the, the cutting and I just wanted to make a, 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 a cross with it. And I pretty much, that's what I did with it. And, 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 that's, and, and so that's what I do a lot of times, whereas a lot of times I will have a breeding um, – direction that i'm going with so to speak with like the sour diesel like i explained but if i have a sour diesel male that i'm using to further that line and then i have a bunch of clone onlys that i have ready to uh, flower i'll throw the clone onlys in with that with that breeding and do a one-time breeding with that and so sometimes those breedings are, um, you know, they're just one-time deals, kind of like what you were talking about, the OG skunk or, or something like that. It was nothing that I really kind of um, was going to further. It was kind of a pile and chuck, one-time deal. And a lot of times the, uh, some of these things uh, take a life of their own. And sometimes people find some really special things on some in some of them. And, um, yeah, you know, you know, it was just something that, you know, I did at the time and it was nothing that I really intended to work any further than what it was, uh, kind of like what Bodie does. He does a lot of one-time pollen chucks. And so, you know, I, 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 I do some of that stuff, but then on the other hand, I do do a directional uh, line breeding in, 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 in a place where I want to go. So it's a little bit of a combination of the both, the, 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 the way I do that. And so would you ever consider doing any feminized breeding? 
Uh, I mean, I've kind of thought about it and, you know, and really getting back to the initial reason why I started breeding was for preservation. So, you know, you can't really have preservation and, um, without a male. I mean, you can, I guess, go from S1 to S, you know, keep S and all the way up. But for me, it's always been about the evolution, I guess, of, of the plant itself and to do breeding that's going to further the genetic pool uh, in time. If, you know, it kind of like bettering each, you're trying to do something better each time. So in theory, over a, a period of time, you should have something that's, you know, that, that, that's evolved into a superior product, so to speak, you know, and I guess, I guess that would really, we, we, we really be, be talking genetic, genetically, you know, where, where over a period of time that, that, yeah, you would have something that would be superior. Yeah, sure. So something I forgot to ask you earlier, but I would be really interested in your perspective on was what was your first impression of OG? Like I'm imagining you were probably growing chem at the time and then all of a sudden OG came out. You know, did that sort of change the game for you or was it still business as usual? Uh, well, it was kind of business as usual for, for us because uh, it wasn't readily available. I mean, it was something I could definitely appreciate it and wanted. But, I mean, we just didn't, we didn't have access to it. You know, I think, like, the first time I was able to get it, I was able to get, like, an ounce or something like that. You know, it was really tightly held, like, anything really good back in the day. And to really get, like, full general access to something like that was just, you know, kind of impossible because it was just locked, you know, it was just held down and locked down so so tightly that it just would, wasn't, you know, wasn't readily available. But, you know, I, I, I mean, as a connoisseur, I thought it was amazing, you know. And, uh, yeah, give me, give me more of it. Give me more of it. So... And it makes me sort of wonder on that same sort of vein, before you guys had Chemdog, what, in your opinion, was the best smoke on the East Coast? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, we're really kind of, you know, going back into, there wasn't really a lot of named strains back then, you know. Like anything that you would get from Amsterdam would be considered something super exotic. Early pearls, the early skunks, uh, the silver pearls, uh, the, I forget, there, there was a couple other ones. And um, yeah, so I mean, back then we thought that was the shit because we just, you know, we just never saw something like that before. So it was really anything that was kind bud or exotic or from Amsterdam or yeah, sense a million, you know, I mean, there was a whole bunch of different things that were around, but not one particular thing that I could be like, you know, because, you know, something would, something great would, would come around and then it would disappear, you know, because the thing was, there wasn't a steady um, uh, flow of that stuff. You know, a lot of stuff got smuggled in and like it made it through one time and that was it. You know, unless it was being locally produced, you know, once once we started locally producing everything, then things became more production like when things were being smuggled in, it was just hit or miss. Yeah, sure. So what would be your recommendation of one of the top dog strains for a more newbie grower? And also, what's your personal favorite strain you've ever made? Uh. Well, right now, what I have available, like right now, the Dirty Taxi seems to be really popular. And if you're really looking for a really kind of a dirty chem, kind of chem D, uh, kind of a tip, uh, that's what I would recommend, the, 
the dirty taxi. Um, we have a, a lot of different stuff out right now uh, that's been selling out. The the sour diesel back cross fours obviously has been really popular. Really good representations uh, of the sour diesel. Uh, money has just you know made some new i ninety five uh, ixs off of his keeper mom. Uh, so they've been flying off the shelf. Um, the piths, the black piths. Um, so really, it really depends on your own personal taste and what you're looking for. You know, you know, I've tried to, you know, cover, you know, all the bases of, you know, a lot of my, uh, personal favorites and try to give people some kind of, uh, representation of that, you know, so, you know, a lot of that really comes down to your own personal stuff. You know, we have uh you know like the, the i-95 stuff is you know kind of og stuff and so we've kind of tried to take in a little bit of the best of everything in, in some type of form so um so, so yeah i mean it's you know a lot of it comes down to personal preference but I, but you know like like i was gonna uh like the star dog you know you you know, so, you know, for a first timer, can't go with the Star Dog. Unfortunately, there's no seeds currently available. But the good thing is, is that uh, there's going to be uh, they're going to be harvested soon. So we just did a remake of the Star Dog. I did uh, yeah the Corey Haim in cross. Uh, we did the Guava in cross. Uh, we did the um, original New York City diesel. And so that was the three chems, which was a re one of uh, a really uh, popular strain, which, you know, w which was originally kind of a pollen chuck, which, you know, because uh, you know, we just had the original New York City diesel and, uh, you know, cross to the star dog. And not really thinking, you know, uh, it would be as, you know, as popular as it was because, uh, you know, basically you got all three chems in there. You got, you got the Trey Dog, which is chem, you know, chem 90, uh, chem D, you know, and then you got that cross to the chem four. And then uh, you got Trey Dog, uh, uh, Trey Dog 91 in there. So you have a good blend of uh, four. 91 in um chem d in there so um yeah that was you know an, an, another good one the three chems that will be uh it, which is being remade yeah brilliant you brought it up because i always saw that three chems and thought that looked particularly nice and you know kudos you also brought up i-95 which is an incredible strain in its own right and you know you see some people who have got some pretty wickedly devotion to it it's uh it's pretty impressive did you ever anticipate the i-95 would become such a success and what was sort of the background on its inception how did it come to be well you know that was that was a money might creation and i you know i believe we we made that in like 2014 2015 uh, we brought some seeds out here to uh, Colorado and we had uh, gifted, we originally gifted some to Tara Rojo, uh, who, who was working in, uh, working for Mindful at the time. And so we uh, gave him some and uh, yeah, uh, and then we, we, that was the original uh release of that and uh that original cross was star dog uh legend og was the male times uh to the triangle kush so um yeah that i mean i don't know what that combination did but it just really opened up uh uh, a, a new box of uh, of the way that I mean the the 
the way the crystals and uh, the formation of the buds and everything it just really you know uh, gave it hybrid v- vigor is really what I'm trying to say really because um, what what really be- came out of it really you couldn't find in any of the in any of the parents sig you know by themselves so um yeah i mean cause it's really got kind of an og tip to it and it's got that stretchiness to it but it's got more of a chemminess i guess and has a little bit more body uh and and stuff to it because of the indigo of the star dog so it's a very very unique um special uh strain and yes a lot of people have tried to uh you know copy it and tried to um make it as their own because it was never really put into like uh full production so um you know, the, you know there was you know uh, releases of it but it was never really uh commercially released across the board and so, you know, the, the packs that were released, uh, you know, people were just find, finding such phenomenal uh, phenos out of it that, you know, the strain kind of just took a life of its own uh, once again. And, you know, people just started, you know, blowing it up, blowing it up. And um, it's probably been more copied i'd say probably than the star dog because the star dog was uh more readily commercially available in releases whereas the i-95 really wasn't you know we had that initial release of it and like i said now it's 2014 2015 and then you know it, you know it wound up blowing up you know over uh you know the first few years and you know uh so yeah uh you know we really didn't really realize the magnitude of of that and um you know he had a limited amount of original stock that he released but i'm i'm pretty sure that he still has you know quite a bit of that original stock that he's that he's sitting on and also, um, you know, he's just recently, um, you know, done a remake of that, you know, f- from that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, is this something that, you know, once again, one of our strains just, you know, it's what other people, you know, did with them and made them popular because we never really kind of pushed. You know, we don't really push any of our strains on people, you know, it's like we release them and, you know, people buy them and then they decide how good they are. So, um, yeah. So one of the questions I was interested in uh, asking you was the chem genetics in general are sort of thought of as having some degree of sensitivity to stress and, you know, somewhat prone to a little bit of instability if they're stressed out when you're breeding with it do you just have to accept that there will be a small amount of instability to a degree or do you believe it's possible to make chem hybrids that are you know say as stable as any other strain so to speak uh no i I think you know you know a lot of that sense of sensitivity you know stays present uh you know a lot of it depends on the the you know the conditions of the grow and so, you know, when you have unstable conditions in a grow, then, uh, yeah, that's going to, you know, affect some of the uh, genetics. And, you know, some of the genetics are really sensitive, like the sour diesel and the 91. And, you know, and even some of the cushions, you can you could say that about the same things, too. So um, if, you know... It's all about environment, and and I think cannabis adapts to environment. And so, you know, if if it's in an environment where it's going to be stress and it thinks it's going to die, you know, obviously it's going to go into self preservation and start to herm out. And that, and I think that's you know um, can be true. That's true with any strain. So, I mean, I think that's a 
built-in mechanism that's in cannabis regardless. And yes, some strains are going to be a little more sensitive than other strains, but really in the end, what's key is having a stable environment, you know, not having light leaks, not having big temperature swings, having your pH right. You know, there's a lot of little different things. You can go down the list of things that happen, you know, and, and what happens is, you know, um, people have an uh, unstable environment. They pop a pack of seeds. They're like half the pack turn male and the other pack hermied on me. Your genetics suck, you know, and so I get that all the time and, you know, and I've argued and I fought with these people, you know, and, you know, and now I, now I just reached the point where, you know, I'll just give you a new pack of seeds, you know, and so, you know, it really comes down, you know, to breeder error. I mean, a grower error, a lot of it. And they, you know, they're quick to point the fig finger at the breeder and they'll say, well, you know, I had a pack of your stuff and a pack of another stuff and the other pack didn't harm, but your pack did. And, you know, so, you know, um, there's just so many variables that, that are in cannabis itself. And then you add that to the variables of, of the conditions it grows in and you just have, you know, you know, you just don't know what it's going to, you know, turn into. So, you know, to, to me, you know, it's, it, it starts with the grower. You know, you have a stable environment, you have everything that's tight, and, you know, you shouldn't really have too many problems, even if you're using sensitive genetics, you know. But, you know, there's always going to be, you know, those cases where, you know, something's going to herm out because of the genetics, or whatever, but you know you have to do your homework on the people that you're, you know, you're you're going to be um, buying seeds from. What kind of what kind of reputation do they have? You know, um, how long have they been making seeds for? You know, how long have these strains been around? Like you know, you know, you, you know. After a while, you have a track record. You know, you gain a reputation and, and it's not what you say about your product. It's what everyone else says about your product. So it kind of speaks for itself. So, you know, you really got to, you know, go into depth and do a lot of research in, you know, in what you're buying. So, you know, you know, and, and usually you, you, you get what you pay for, you know, and if you're going to do research into someone and you, and you know, they're going to have good genetics and yeah, they're probably going to cost you, you know, more, more than your, your, your usual uh, pack, you know, 150, $200, $300, you know, but you, you know what you're getting, you know what I mean? When you buy a $50 pack of someone that that's knocked off someone and yeah, you might be able to find some really good stuff in there. And, and on, on, on the other hand, yeah, you might get fucked and, and, and it might get a Hermie bomb. So, um, yeah, it's really, you know, uh, the way that I've always looked at it is it's like I've always tried to buy my seeds from the source, from the original source or as close as you can get it. You know, so that's why I went to Sensi Seeds, you know, I mean, and and I've bought other greenhouse and you know mr nice and you know all these other name breeders i i buy from the source you know and you know so you know what you sh you should be getting and you know the re reputation behind it and when you're just buying some random cross or you know it's it, it's a crap shoot and you know you, you get what you pay for in the end so true so true so we've just got a few final fan submitted questions before we do our final five quick ones. One I'm definitely interested to hear your answer to is, do you know any of the origins of the Nigerian silk? No. I mean, I was given the Nigerian um, as a clone only. Um, from, my, from what I remember, um, it came from a group of people up in New Paul's, New York, 
who were a bunch of skydivers. So actually, I think the, the cutting came from a girl. And from, from what I read, the, the story that I w- was told that I guess someone had taken a trip over to Nigeria and brought back these seeds and they were grown upstate. Now, how true that is, I, I, I don't know, because I didn't, I didn't know the original people, the skydiving people. I didn't know any of them. So uh, it was my friend who I got the cutting from. So I can only go by what I was told. And, um, yeah, that's as far back as I can go with it. You know, I know that there's been, uh, I know, I know that Neville had released some Nigerian, uh, seeds at some point and there might've been a few other people, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I remember first seeing the Nigerian from, uh, the weasel, uh, he was growing it uh, back in the mid '90s, and I remember getting it once or twice. And I remember him saying how it took too long and it yielded too little, and he cut it out. And uh, once I remember, you know, and then once once I once I was able to get the cutting. Uh, yeah, I jumped on that, on that opportunity, and then you know, just like I would with any elite uh, strain that I got, I tried to make some type of uh, representation in seed. So I mean, that's really you know what I did, and uh, and that's what I've always been trying, you know, I've been doing all along, and just you know, I've just been kind of fortunate on the way things have been working out yeah very nice i think that's more information than i knew on it so that's great the next one was have you ever been given any breeding advice that was particularly memorable or left an impact on you no i mean not not particularly from one person because i've kind of learned you know everything myself going along I mean, obviously, you know, I've, I've read, you know, publications from DJ Short, Mal Frank, you know, Ed Rosenthal, and, you know, so on and so forth. So I've tried to, you know, do as much, you know, uh, research that I could do um, as possible, you know, other than, you know, really meeting, you know, you know, Neville or a Shanti, or, you know, one of these, you know, uh, skunk man, and having, you know, one of these guys, you know, telling you something, um, some type of secret other than that, but not, no, because you never get that, you know, you never get that the chance to meet people like that and and even if you did i don't think they would tell you their breeding secrets so you know a lot of these things you gotta kind of just you know learn as you go along uh try to do as much research as you can uh, there's you know there's, there's a lot of books out there you know and now with the internet and everything you can kind of get you know a lot more information that that used to be out there that you can get now yeah definitely grateful for all the amount of information that's out there that's for sure so the next question was for you personally what are the most rare seeds in your collection um that's kind of a hard question because i have so many seeds i mean i have seeds from all around the world i mean um and i guess you know um probably you know more of the land race kind of stuff i would say you know uh because you know a lot of the stuff you know um you know i just made you know i I made it you know so you know really um i i really can't i really don't have an you know I'm, i'm trying to think i really don't have a specific answer that I can give you because I would say it's my whole, my whole collection in itself, you know, because, um, I can't, 
point to one particular thing and say like that is you know the creme de la creme so to speak you know because everything is is so different and special in its own right and deserves its own space so i mean and there's such a and, and the thing about cannabis is such a, a wide spectrum of different varieties and, and which give you different effects and just everything. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing that would be most valuable is something that I can't get, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so if I can get, if, if I could have something that I can't get, I would say that would be the most valuable thing. But because uh, most things you can get, you know, what I mean, and, and, and especially, you know, uh, you know, luckily, like, you know, someone like me, um, you know, if there's something that I really want, I mean, I can make a post about it. And I'm pretty sure like someone out there you know, would offer me some kind of a trade or, or something like that, you know what I mean? But it doesn't always work like that, you know what I mean? It doesn't, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I mean, the, I guess the thing that, you know, people want the most right now is that roadkill, that original roadkill skunk, that mass super skunk, that, you know, rancid, you know skunk so um yeah you know i mean so i mean that's what that's what everyone's looking for now so i mean and that's really why you know i i you know i'm getting back to the land race stuff and you know so i would have to say probably some of that land race stuff because you just don't know what the potential of something could be in there whereas a lot of the stuff i already know what it is you know so i that's what I, that would probably be the answer is kind of like the unknown because you know if you have something that you think has potential but you just don't know what it is until you actually get into it you know whereas you might have a bunch of seed stock that you made and you already kind of know what it is and you already have you know stuff that you know clones or whatever so yeah that's yeah that's what i would say yeah strong words i dig it so on to our final five quick questions before we wrap this one up so first one is what is the best or most memorable single sort of hit or smoking session you've ever had what left the biggest impression on you uh well, I told that, that that story earlier about the tie. You know, that was that 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 was probably one of the you know most uh, memorable smoking sessions that really uh, made an impression on me. You know, when I you know broke out this 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 tie weed out of you know in the dead dead show parking lot. You know, when there's you know eight ten people in a circle, and you know. And we're smoking and people are dropping out like flies. I mean, that was, you know, that, that told me that that weed was killer. Great answer. It sounds amazing. So on the other end of the spectrum, was there ever a time when everyone around you was really hyped about this new strain and everyone's talking it up and then you finally try it and you just really weren't impressed? Yeah, uh, I guess like the Girl Scout cookies and you know, stuff like that. You know, I mean, there's been, I mean, there's been a lot of strains like that. I mean, just, you know, being on the internet for so long and, you know, you, uh, you get caught up in uh, the hype that people put out. It's kind of like how I explained, you know, the lore of certain things and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and, and kind of like a perfect, perfect, perfect example would be kind of like the Bubba Kush. Like that was something I was, you know, really, you know, really excited to get. And then when I finally got to grow it out and smoke it, not that it wasn't that bad, but it wasn't that good. And I can kind of 
see how it had its time and place in history at one time. But by the time that I got it, I already had other strains that fucking, you know, that crushed it. You know what I mean? So, you know, there's a lot of things out there that, you know, you know that you hear about and are hyped up and so on and so forth. And, you know, you finally get into them and then you're just like, it's, it's not all that. And, you know, that's kind of how I feel with, you know, a lot of the designer strains that, you know, that are coming out now and everything. And so, you know, uh, the Skittles, you know, when I finally got to try the Skittles, I mean, it, it had a nice, you know, nice taste all in all to it. But I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it probably tested out in the in the low teens in, in THC. But once you put that into concentrates, now that becomes a whole different product. So yeah, on one one hand, I could say, yeah, I didn't like the flour. It kind of sucked, but it, you know, it had a nice flavor to it. But once you put that into concentrates, now, you know, now you're talking about concentrates where you're concentrating the THC. And really at that point, it's only about flavor. You know, so now, now you're taking something that is not really such a great flower and now making it into a, a, a concentrate product that is exceptional for some people. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's you just don't know what what what, you know, what will what, what will become out, what can become out of a stream, should I say? Yeah, good insight. So. Let's do a desert island situation. If you could only take three strains with you onto a desert island, what are you going to take? Uh, I'm going to take the Chem D. I'm going to take uh, uh, probably the Black Haze Piff and uh, probably the OG, a good OG. You know, so that, I mean that's you know, so really that would be kind of like. You know, I got a really good heavy indigo. I got a really good haze sativa. And then the OG could kind of be like a nice little hybrid, you know. So, uh, yeah, I think that those th those three would be my choices. Yeah, three really nice picks. I could, I could get behind those. So now to be a little bit devil's advocate. All right, so now we're going to drop someone else off on the island. And you don't like this person very much. But you get to choose the three strains you leave them with. What are you going to leave them with? <laughs> well, if I don't like them very much, <laughs> uh, I'd have to, you know, I guess you'd have to give them the blue dream just because, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I guess I'd have to give them, you know, the Girl Scout cookie. <laughs> You know, I'd have to give them something to, something just to give you, uh, just enough. You, you just don't get, it just doesn't get you quite there. <laughs> you know, you're almost there, but almost not quite there, you know. Uh, and then I guess, you know, I just have to give them a skunk one, you know, because uh, what can be more generic than a, than a skunk one nowadays, so... I guess that those would be my three. Some really good answers there. So final question for the interview. If you could go back to any place and time in history, where would you go and what seeds would you collect while you were there? Um, it would definitely have to be back, you know, in Afghanistan. You know, definitely during the Silk Road time. You know, there was a time, you know, and, and this is really... I believe the, the inception of uh, land race seeds because um, in England, they used to run tours, you know, um, and they used to run train and bus tours to India. And uh, it would go as far as Bangkok. And um, if you know anything about the history of the Silk Road and the, the routes that it took, um, 
you were able to um, basically, you know, travel in a lot of these um, Muslim hash producing countries, you know, where, where hash was, you know, originally from. And um, yeah, I mean, you used to be able to uh, just travel freely across Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, you know, the Hindu Kush, India, um, Nepal, uh, Morocco, all, all of these countries uh, were very friendly to backpacking hippies and adventurers. And uh, most of these countries uh, were legal back then. You know, we're, we're, we're talking uh, early 70s, late 60s, uh, you know, before uh, the drug war. Uh, you know, it, it was really during that time that Nixon, Nixon really forced a lot of those countries to go illegal because we were, um, you know, we were funding a lot of those poor countries. And when we just basically told them either you make it illegal or we're not giving you any more money. And so, you know, a lot of those countries were just forced, you know, to um, go illegal and, you know, over, you know, uh, generations, you know, it just a lot of it has become taboo in some of these countries like Thailand, for instance, you know, uh, cannabis is pretty taboo. Uh, with the general population over there. And um, the same could be said in, in a lot of uh, Asian countries, you know, um, most of the modern Asian countries, should I say, you know, you can go to uh, Vietnam and Laos and in that in those places. And, and you know, the, cu the cultural still is, is, is alive, you know, and, you know, and that really dates back to, uh, you know, them just using uh, uh, cannabis and hemp for general use in, 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 med in medicine, you know, so, so they've been using, you know, this stuff for centuries and had been until, you know, the United States came in and told them they couldn't do it anymore. So, you know, hopefully, you know, um, all of that stuff will, you know, will be coming back in, in the future as, you know, we get over the, the stigma of, uh, you know, illegal cannabis and it's harmful and it's a gateway drug and so on and so forth. Yeah, what a fantastic sentiment to end things on. So, you know, thank you so much, JJ, for coming by and for sharing all your knowledge and your experiences. Did you have any comments or shout outs you wanted to make before we wrap things up? No, no, no I, I know. I appreciate you have having me on. And, um, yeah, I just appreciate everyone's support. And, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, everyone that's, you know, supported me and helped me over the years, you know, I wouldn't be, you know, the person that I am now. So I just want, you know, to thank everyone that's, you know, that's ever, you know, uh, ran a pack of seeds or, you know, um, made any type of, you know, you know showed any type of support it's you know um, it's nothing that i ever really uh imagined it's blossomed into so um i just really um consider myself very lucky and um you know you know and consider uh you know, just to be uh, in a very special, uh, special uh, spot, you know, and um, I just want to thank everyone because if it wasn't for them, it wouldn't be possible. So, No, fantastic. And, you know, likewise, thank you for everything you've done and for coming on the show and sharing all your knowledge. It was great to talk to you. And there you have it, gang. 
the end of part three, a fantastic ending to this monster trilogy episode. That has been JJ NYC of Top Dog Genetics sharing all the information he has on the New York scene, breeding with Top Dog, strains, so much more. Thank you so much, JJ, for sharing all of your knowledge. We're incredibly appreciative. As always, a huge shout out to our amazing sponsors for helping us to make the show happen. CT now, best seed bank in the game. Go hit them up for all the hottest drops from all the breeders you know, you love. Guarantee on satisfaction at the end of a cycle, not just guarantee on germination. Why would you go elsewhere? Likewise, go check out Coppet Biological Systems. With all the most advanced technologies, these guys have got you covered and will keep the pests at bay. Check out the Apipar M or the Spidex Vital. Both of them incredible products. It's going to help you overcome any infestation you have, or more importantly, keep away a potential infestation. Nothing better than being proactive and getting on top of a problem before it even exists, guys. Go check out Coppet Biological Systems. Incredible sponsors. We really appreciate them. And last but not least, Promix Connect. Your number one mycorrhizal product in the game. You know Promix. You've probably bought their peat before. Guess what? They've got a killer mycorrhizal product now. And if you check it out, I promise you, your plants will be better off for it. No questions asked. Better resin, better flavor, better yield. You know mycorrhizal is fantastic. I don't need to sell you on it. Go check it out. Promix Connect. Number one mycorrhizal product in the game. Furthermore, huge shout out to Charlie's Cannabis your number one family-owned small batch craft cannabis producer out of Oklahoma, providing you with incredible flavors, chemical sunset, star pebbles, so many more on the horizon. Check out their Instagram to see what they've been hunting at the moment. I'm really excited to have these guys on board, and I think it's going to be magical to see what they produce going forward. If you need some high-quality smoke, you're in Oklahoma, go check out Charlie's Cannabis. You'll be puffing good, I promise. Finally, shout out to the Patreon gang. I love you. I appreciate you. You are the best. If you want to get access to unheard content, early access to interviews, giveaways, so much more, go check it out. We recently got a Discord, guys. I'm a bit late to the Discord party, but I tell you what, I'm loving it. Some good chats going on there. Be sure to check out Patreon if you want to help support the show and ensure content continues to be made. That's it for part one, guys. I'll see you back for part two and part three. Thanks for hanging around. We'll see you.